welcome back to Cocktails, Tangents, and Answers. Uh, we hope you've been enjoying the episodes. Uh, I'm one of your hosts, Rich Mackey, as you probably know by now. Hopefully you know. I'm Caitlin Dre, your other host. Yeah, and this is going to be a little bit of a break from the format, so we're not going to be interviewing a guest. Today, Caitlin and I are going to talk about... We're just going to talk to you at length. Yes, we'll try to curb it and you know, maybe 90, <laughs> 180 minutes now, about 30 minutes or so, maybe 40, we'll see. Settle in, folks. But today's topic is workplace culture. Like, what does it mean? Why is it important in the agency biz? Um, and this is a big one for me. Um Part of why I do what I do is for all of you. Mm -hmm. And that also rhymes a little bit, which is kind of fun. (laughs) We're going to write a poem. I know. And all of you being your... The team. Yeah. So you, Caitlin, are one of the team. Yes. Um, We have other team members. You know, Zach is our producer. He's here in the room with us. uh, And we've got an audience of one (laughs) uh, with one of the other team members who recorded an episode earlier who's still here sitting very, very quietly. But yeah, so it's... um, I don't know. Like, I love marketing. I love doing marketing. Mm -hmm. But this idea that, you know, having a business where people can thrive and I can watch them thrive is really great. Yeah. But I digress. That's actually technically a tangent. That's a tangent. Because this is the intro. Yeah. And I I need you. you Yes. About what we we have on the menu. Uh, Today's cocktail, featured cocktail, is a jungle bird. And um, I have recently become as well as a gin drinker, but also a rum drinker. I love a good rum, like a rum punch situation. So a jungle bird is dark rum. Uh, I'm told that Appleton is one of the better dark rums, uh, three quarters ounce of Aperol, one and a half ounces of pineapple juice, Mm -hmm. half an ounce of lime juice, freshly squeezed and half an ounce of simple syrup. And it is tropical and Delightful. It tastes like juice, which so it basically is. You got me into these, mm-hmm. gosh, months ago. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, mid-pandemic. When everyone was just sitting in their house drinking. Yeah, because we had, so what's interesting. Some of us haven't stopped. <laughs> <laughs> Amen to that. Whoops. What's interesting is we always have Aperol on hand. So we've mm-hmm. been to Italy a couple of times. we got friends yeah. there. We love a good spritz. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. We've gotten into yeah. Italica spritzes, which are a little bit different mm-hmm. as well. Maybe we'll talk about one of those in another yeah. episode. Uh, also, the bottle is just gorgeous on Italica mm-hmm. spritz. But, you know, Aperol spritz is kind of what you do with Aperol. Like, yeah. what else do you do with it? Mm-hmm. And I think we're having a conversation. And we also, like, complete tangent. So we'll make, we'll meal prep chicken and we use a small can of pineapple juice in the Instant and Pot. And then what do you, you, what do and you do with the And then we got three more cans. Yeah. I got yeah. three more cans. I can't use it, like, every day. Yeah. And so this weird idea that there's this drink out there that's mm-hmm. pineapple juice yeah. and Aperol. Yeah. Um, And we also have a ton of rum because we went to the Virgin Islands at one point and came back with like two cases of Cruzon rum. Yeah. Uh, Between four people, I think, if anybody is listening, because I think there's an import limit. (laughs) How many liters a person can bring? U.S. Customs and Border Um, Control. It's going to be knocking on your door. Yeah. And we really do like it. The difference we did. So we used the Cruzon dark rum, Mm -hmm. but then we did a little floater of blackstrap rum. I was just going to say, I'm like, blackstrap is really, you want a dark rum. It just, uh, it just like that molassesy kind of going through. The, yep. the bitter of the Aperol yeah. and the, oh, Jungle Bird. Yeah. Such a good drink. It is. It's a really great summer drink too. Mm-hmm. Like, I know. We're so close to summer We're getting right there. We had like two days of it and we then did. it snowed. Yeah. Uh, lovely. That's, that's life here in the Midwest. Now, uh, as far as like a, a pineapple scenario is concerned, um, when my parents went to in Texas and when my husband and I, it was like literally right before the pandemic started. We flew back on like February 28th or something. Oof. And, uh, um, uh, when we flew down to tell my parents that we were having a baby, my husband and my mom went to this like open air bar and ordered these beautiful, like cocktails. And they came in the shell of a pineapple. And I have never been, more jealous about someone's beverage than I was in that moment. Oh, uh, and, and of course, so, so you're like, pregnant, so yeah. you can't have one then. And then you come and then home, you just, it's like, pandemic, yeah. and it's like, well, I'm not flying down there now. Yeah, yes. So uh, I'm really looking forward to going back. Hopefully that restaurant has survived the last two years. But in that uh, pineapple beverage 
vessel scenario, my husband was like, well, we can figure out how to core a pineapple. Oh, it's not hard. So, oh yeah, we have the tool, we have the technology. And uh, for a while we had like three frozen pineapple shells just like waiting to be filled with a delicious beverage. And I think um, I might make him make me a jungle bird in a pineapple shell. I think a jungle bird in a pineapple shell is great. With just like a ridiculous number of garnishes. Well, and how much, (laughs) like how many ounces does a pineapple shell hold? That's gotta be- Many. That's, it's a, I mean, like, that's like a Vegas drink. Like, so that's the... <laughs> here, I'm on board. So here's my movie night. I I love a good uh, Thai fried rice in a pineapple shell. Yeah. I had that in San Diego a couple yep. times. My favorite thing. So I need Thai fried rice in a pineapple shell. And then the other half of the shell <laughs> is a jungle is bird. The, so you're thinking in, like, a flat situation. Oh, yeah. Are you, like, the yeah. coconut Yeah, round? it's like... No, oh. it's like the whole... So we have, oh, like, an OXO. it's the whole pineapple. Is it OXO or is it OXO? Like, the kitchen tool? OXO, I think. Yeah, OXO. I don't know. We'll Hugs and kisses. Later. Is that right? what it is? Exactly. So my grandma would call it. But it like it's like a oh yeah it's like a so you get down from the top. yeah it's like a spiralizer for the pineapple oh. so it takes the core out and then it spiralizes the so you're like, doing a pineapple meat. tall boy basically yes, exactly wow now I'm like, definitely flat down sided with this. you could do like a party beverage where you like have the pineapple oh. and then scoop out the inside I was just thinking of like like holding a like a soup bowl and just like <laughs> sipping it which nobody can see but I'm doing it yeah with my right hands. yeah but um. So I like this even better. Yeah. So we basically need three pineapples then. So we need two halves to put our Thai fried rice in. Yep. And then we each need to core a pineapple tall boy to load up with, I don't know, like 30 ounces of liquor. It's a lot of, it's a, it's a significant vessel. We're back. I think we've talked before, or maybe we do again. I don't know the order of these people, Aaron, but, um, about like needing to basically be able to sleep where you're finishing your drink Uh because you're not going to be walking up any stairs. Yep. Yep. Interesting. We have that built into our home bar. We actually have like a like a, a designated area for the like I was overserved crowd. I, I like. To, I think it looks like. I think I like to call it a nap nook. It is a nap nook. That's fair. I yeah. could go over there and nap. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and incidentally, we are recording this in your home bar uh-huh. at the moment, so it's the nap nook is right nap. over there. It's very cozy. All right. Well, I think we need to take a break, and then we'll be back to talk yeah. about workplace culture. We're back. And we're back. And we're back. <laughs> All right. Sometimes a little goofiness happens in the break. <laughs> a lot of goofiness. That's like my middle name. Or I start talking about the topic in the podcast. And I'm like, shut up, shut like, up, wait, shut wait, up. Wait, we're not recording. This is good stuff. I am really excited about this, but I'm also like a little bit nervous because I've worked a lot of tough places. Mm-hmm. So I'm I'm nervous that I'm just gonna like get out the get out the burn book and like <laughs> well, I will not let that happen. Right? So <laughs> keep it together. I've had I mean I've had some good places that I've worked. I've had good that's gone bad. Yeah. Like uh, you know, I went through the the large agency layoffs in Chicago uh-huh. in the early 2000s when our agency went from 600 people to 150 Oof. people. Um, and I've also had some really great bosses in really yeah. toxic environments. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's um, honestly helped me stay there longer because who you work for matters. It, it makes sense. So I think... First, we need to like back up and what, Probably. <laughs> what like we need to maybe just define like a positive culture. Like it feels so nebulous and like could be a different thing to different people. But yeah. I think one of the kind of definitions I nerd out on Brene Brown like so hard. Uh, yes, yes, yes. And I was listening to something earlier um, about like defining positive culture and it really just centers around psychological safety like allow and she talks a lot about uh, please like everyone should just like read and love Brene Brown but she talks a lot about like people showing up as themselves and like being allowed to do that safely and not being nervous about like hiding or like degradation or being called names or you know like so all of it I I mean and there's research around it is just like centered on psychological safety and showing up as a whole person instead of just a cog. Yeah. And I just finished, um, and I, my brain is terrible. But, um, <laughs> we um, remember stuff, but like not all of it at um, the right time. <laughs> I just finished a book by Simon Sinek. It was, um, I think I've talked about it a little bit yeah. at work, even the impossible, um, 
game. Yeah, I need to, the I was like, do I need game. to look it up? <laughs> no, the impossible game. Um, and one of the things he says in there, and it, it's also in a little small book that I've been looking at as well, a really fun book that's really easy to read that he created. Um, he says the exact same thing almost. And I know that he and Brene Brown, I think they know each other, actually. I'm sure they've crossed each other on the circuits and things. But he says that the number one thing employees need is to feel safe at work. The number two thing that they need is to feel secure in their job. Mm -hmm. Um, And then there were a couple more, but I just couldn't get past those first two. And thinking, well, like, I hope our entire team feels those two. And I think they do. But, you know, you really can never tell. Mm -hmm. That's a very personal thing. But thinking back to the times when I didn't, like... when it you don't just, feel like, safe it at work, bleeds oh my into gosh. everything else, yeah. And especially like I've had previous jobs and bosses where it like you can't turn that feeling off. So like mm-hmm. you don't feel safe, you don't feel supported, and it's not like fi- like I never felt physically unsafe, but I definitely did not feel like I could be open and honest with mm-hmm previous supervisors or bosses or even other team members because it was so like cutthroat and like you never knew what was going to get back to and like they're not having like an ally or a, a an outlet to say like hey i think that's kind of fucked up and like maybe we should talk to somebody about yeah. it but like not knowing where that safe place was mm-hmm. Yeah. And I've had, so I was lucky because early in my career, as I kind of got out of the Midwest, Mm -hmm. well, I was still in the Midwest. I was in Chicago, Mm -hmm. but very large city, very large worldwide agency was Ogilvy and Mather uh, or Ogilvy as I think they just go by now. (laughs) Um, Mather hasn't been there for a long time, Um, but um, it was fine. So new city, new situation. I'm in my twenties. I can be completely open and honest about who I am. Mm -hmm. No big deal. Cause it's an ad agency. I mean, we had like a beer fridge that was stocked. Like, you know, they just stopped like smoking in the offices (laughs) except for one agency that had Marlboro as a client and they had to, they just paid the fines because the client had to be able to smoke in their office. Yeah. So like, I was glad I didn't work there. That wasn't us. My my asthmatic lungs are just like, yeah, we had some, uh, some Miller work. And so we, had all this Miller booze yeah. in one of the conference rooms. It was locked. Yeah. And, but there were certain times at three o'clock when you would just get a message to like, come to the conference room <laughs> and it would it's be unlocked and we'd celebrate. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't like beer. Can I go downstairs and get a margarita from right. the bar and come back up? Um, but margaritas to go weren't a thing. Like, thank God they are now. Right. Um, How do we live without a cocktail to go? But yeah, so I left that though. I went to another agency and it was great. And our biggest client was PepsiCo. And we were on a, a woman run piece of business. Um, there were no issues with mm-hmm. being who you were in any way, yeah. shape. You know, you can be gay, you can be straight, you can be a woman, you can mm-hmm. be a man. They were really, really open to all voices in the room. Mm-hmm. You could be young, you could be old. It didn't just didn't matter. I, it's, I could be brown, I could be blue. Yep. <laughs> it was like that, yeah. And it was like the and that was the Gatorade side of PepsiCo, which was um, just really, really like a family, and it was mm-hmm. such a wonderful client to have. That's interesting. And then I left there and I went to the corporate side to a wireless carrier, mm-hmm. and it was instantly like I couldn't be me right away there were a few people that kind of knew everything about me Mm -hmm. but it was very much a 50 60 something this is ironic as i say this now (laughs) but basically a 50 60 something like straight white men like kind of culture and it just didn't feel right it didn't feel safe i didn't feel safe i didn't feel secure i didn't again i didn't feel like i was gonna be attacked did you feel like your job was at risk or like you were going to be like no because the the c C level person that i reported to would not have let that happen Mm -hmm. so i didn't feel like my job was at risk there later in the company yes i did Mm -hmm. and it was just a nightmare but that wasn't really but that wasn't related to that no not at all but you know so going there and then it's like oh crap like i left my bubble of the ad agency mm-hmm. world where you can swear in meetings you can drink like <laughs> yeah two margaritas at lunch on a rough day is not a big deal yeah. and you feel like you everybody is who they are as weird mm-hmm. and as many crazy things as they've got going on and i've entered this like this corporate world that's restrictive mm-hmm. um when i left there i went to a different company oddly enough in financial services but um lots and lots of women in uh, positions of power. So my boss was a woman. The chief marketing officer was a woman. Mm-hmm. The head of HR was a woman. The head mm-hmm. of PR was a woman. Like there were all of these wonderful women 
And suddenly it was a corporate world where I was included as who I was, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and we even at one point like had a gender neutral bathroom, like put into a building they were building. And I was just like, and it was a straight woman championing for it because she's like, if it was my kid, I would want them to have a place they feel comfortable. And it was just like, can I ask what year that was like roughly? uh, It would have been (laughs) 2014. Okay. 14 so not or 15. Like, okay. Not like yesterday, but like, yeah, you know, it was one of those things. It was topical at the time, but there was a diversity and inclusion uh, group. Mm-hmm. Um, and there were subgroups off of that yeah. for like, you know, race or country of origin or LGBT and things like that. Yeah. Um, it was just a very different, like, I'm like, oh, so you can have a big, like, I mean, it's finance. So like, mm-hmm. it's an old white man's world. Mm-hmm. Not so much anymore. It's, it's getting there, yeah. but that's typically who runs those big companies, but you can have one that's more progressive in how they treat their employees. Yeah. And the culture was just so different from wireless, which should be really loose. Like, mm-hmm. you know, but telecom, I suppose. Maybe. Telecom is, like, yeah. It, yeah, it's an interesting business. I enjoyed it. Like we had a great time and, and things did loosen up there, but I had to prove myself, Yeah, you know, where I wasn't just taken at face value. Mm-hmm. Um, and once I did, like my fears were probably a little unfounded going in at the, at the beginning. Yeah. But at the same time, just the vibe just yeah. didn't feel like my vibe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but the money was great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's. I just like, I could regurgitate this whole, um, there's an MIT Sloan management review Mm -hmm. article about like what has predicted as kind of workplace environments have shifted, like toxic culture is one of the most often cited reasons Mm -hmm. for people leaving. And I, cannot endorse that enough that oh yeah it's it's i mean so like compensation is obviously an important factor but then you look that's like second even to corporate culture and like whether or not people can show up fully as themselves but i think that's what is so interesting about our culture is i mean aside from our spectacular benefits package and you know, like our remote work options and Mm -hmm. our paid family leave and like all of those things are markers, I think, or indicators of our culture. But the bottom line is like, you would never do anything as the president, CEO, what's your like official? Both. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The HBIC of this company, like you would never do something to or for us that you wouldn't do to or for yourself. Yeah. And like, that's such a unique and valuable, like North star as a, as a company. Like I think, cause you've worked shitty places before and like, oh, you've yeah. seen, like you've seen the, the flip side of that coin, like knowing. Yeah. You learn from <clears throat> the bad, like you learn yeah. from the bad, sometimes almost more than you learn from the good. Absolutely. Um, but you're right. I mean, and I participate in our vet benefits. Like mm-hmm. I get the hundred dollars for DoorDash every month. Like you do. <laughs> like I'm excited when that thing yeah, rolls over okay. on the first it's March 1st. Thank like goodness. very exciting. Yeah. So we'll see if that, I mean, we put that out as a temporary benefit from tax reasons. So we'll yeah. see if it continues. It's going through the end of this year and then yeah. we'll, we'll talk about it. Yeah. But you know, people talking about, I guess let me roll back. Like our benefits are kind of stupid for a company our size. It's ridiculous. Like, it's obscene. And part of that is on purpose because yeah. our, our business is all about people. Mm-hmm. And the consistency of our people and the cohesion of our people mm-hmm. is extremely important. Yeah. And that all comes down to culture and yeah. people. Like those yeah. two things tie together. So for me, benefits are table stakes. So mm-hmm. well, not necessarily the DoorDash one. That's kind of a bonus extra, a little right. cherry on yeah, top. Yeah, yeah. But like, you know, the fact that we offer health insurance. Legally, we don't have to until we hit 50 people. Mm-hmm. Well, we do, even though we don't have 50 people because Mm -hmm. you guys being healthy makes sense to me. Yeah. You know? So that's another, that's like actually really interesting. One of the, the things in this, um, MIT article was talking about how like your stress at work is the like number one predictor of physical health. Oh yeah. So like 35 to 50, if you're stressed at work, you're like 35 to 55% more likely to develop, uh, like, serious illness like heart disease or like all of these things and gain weight like every time i've been extremely stressed at (laughs) work i've just Mm -hmm. away we go yeah um 
Yeah. I mean, but like health insurance is table stakes. Our 401k for me, like mm -hmm. it's been important to me. I didn't get into it as early as I could have. So, you know, mm -hmm. we got a lot of young people and it's like, just start committing, contributing it's, at least to the match. It's free money. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, those things are kind of table stakes. And then we really try to go above and beyond. Mm -hmm. Um, the flexible work, I work from home sometimes one day a week. Yeah. I used to do every Friday from home, uh, because it's quiet. I can pull things together. I can wrap up my week and think about the next week. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, you can work anywhere. And actually on that one, um, this week, it was actually our producer, Zach, mm -hmm. who sent me a message because it snowed. We got three inches of snow in Omaha overnight. It was just crazy. Ugh. So we woke up to this and the city was unprepared. Streets weren't plowed. Yeah. Right, right. And so he emailed me or he sent me a message in our, our messaging platform and said, hey, the streets look really slick. I'm going to work from home. Yeah. And the important piece of that for me is I'm going to work from home. It was a statement and not a question. Yes. He was mm -hmm. telling me and not asking me because mm -hmm. you don't have to ask if you need to work from home, yeah. especially in an emergency like that. Now, yeah. if you're randomly, you know, sending me a message every Monday at 830 <laughs> right. that you're going to work from home, we're going to have a little conversation about like, what are you doing on your Sunday nights? Yeah. <laughs> um, and that's in our policy. It's clearly yeah. written. But the fact that when somebody asks if it's OK to work from home, mm -hmm. It's like the, the book says it's okay. Right. We have a process for that. You fill out this thing yeah. online. It's automatically approved. Everybody knows it on the calendar and you do your work from home. Yeah. I don't care where you are. You could go live in France for a month if yeah. you wanted to just log in and do your work. Right. Like that's what's important. Yeah. I think so much of it goes back to just trusting people to do what they're supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. And like this infantilizing of employees that happens at not even necessarily like large companies, you know, when you're talking like a thousand or more employees or whatever the like metric is, mm -hmm. but even in organizations where the leadership isn't secure with themselves or they don't trust their team and it just spirals into this like micromanagement yep. and like handholding and um, just like, really nitpicky, terrible stuff. Like I had a previous job was told like I was stupid, like flat out. Wow. Yeah. It was like, and like recovering. <laughs> yeah, that? I know. It's like that. Like I, I have like tried to like dial it back, like try to forget that. And like, there have been moments where like I get really like nervous or stressed out because something like hasn't gone according to plan or like, I don't know how to do something. And it's like, I still cannot like show up for our team because of that, like past experience. We're like unlearning the, yeah. you know, like it's so hard and it just like, it sticks with you. Oh yeah. It's okay to not know stuff. But if you came from a place where you were stupid for not knowing everything, yeah. Yeah, that's that's really hard. It was horrible. Yeah, yeah. So let's like pivot a little bit. Yeah. Um, what like what does a positive workplace culture mean to you? Like, what do you like about a positive workplace culture? And I guess you know, coming in here, you've been here a few years. It's almost now? three. Yeah, almost, almost three, three years. Mm -hmm. uh, good for me. I was really right. close. Yeah, a few. A um, few is three, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> but like, you know, what were some things where you're like, where you like finally had like we're able to breathe and be like, oh, this is okay. Mm -hmm. I think the, I mean, like the most recent example is just like coming to you and saying like working full time is not mm -hmm. working for me anymore. And you were like, okay, great. How do we fix that? And it was like, I had this conversation. I mean, like my husband and I went back and forth. We have an 18 month old and his job at the time and still a little bit is super stressful. I mean, like he makes more money than I do. It's like typical patriarch nonsense. We don't have time for that today, but <laughs> <laughs> he did wish me a happy international women's day, which was really moving. Um, anyway, it, it became untenable for us to like manage our home life and mm -hmm. also like be full employees and like it doesn't make sense for him to step back because he's the breadwinner in the house and so that has become this like cloud that was hanging over and I like we went back and forth for um, at least a month of like I don't know if this is the right time I don't know if that makes sense like and he said at one point he's like what happens if they tell you no and like that had not even <laughs> I was like oh I don't know what happens if they tell me no. Like, then what do we do? I was like, I guess I keep working. Like, I don't know. But it, it had not, like, occurred to me that that wouldn't be 
an option. And, because, and so it's, yeah, it's good to me that that didn't occur to you. Cause I mean, you started part time, mm-hmm. um, and you came in like not knowing the agency industry and just being like, I'm going to manage projects. Figure it's it like, out. Okay, yeah. great. Um, and then you hit a point where, you know, you were ready to go full time. We mm-hmm. wanted you full time. You're like, you know what? Yeah, that works for us. But it was also a time when like my child was not walking mm-hmm. and we were still working from home a hundred percent of the time. Yeah. And so it was like, this makes sense right now. Well, and I know you'd have the option to work from home 100% of the time, yeah. but you also extrovert that you are. I really like love being in the being, office. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And so, and I remember when we, um, when we split your job, mm-hmm. when um, we shifted you to uh, out of project management and said, yeah. hey, we're going to hire somebody there. Like my conversation with you was like, Hey, what do you not like? What do yeah. you love about your job? What do you not like about your job? If you could get rid of half of it, what would it be? Yeah. And you just paused for a really uncomfortably long time. <laughs> And I was like, are you okay? I'm like, okay, let me keep going. Like, Cause we're looking at splitting your job and you can keep the half you like, and I'll mm-hmm. go hire somebody to do the half you don't, because I think I know what you don't like and yeah. what you do like. And you're like, oh, oh, okay. Like, and so for me, like coming from that to like, it hadn't occurred to me that they would say <laughs> I couldn't go part-time like, Ooh, shit. shit. I don't know what to do with that information. Yeah. Yeah. So we got to work on, we're, we got to work on your husband about like, dude like i'm not and and i think that's just the difference like he works for a large Mm -hmm. company with a you know a very rigid hierarchy there it's a wonderful place he really loves the people he works for but like that is not he could not conceive of that option in his role and the fact that it was met with such like acceptance was really unsurprising to me in like a in a in a very great way well, good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and we just basically said, so when do you want to do this? And we've got somebody coming on board. That's yeah. great. Here's your transition period. And boom, on mm-hmm. this date, you're part time and mm-hmm. I'll adjust it in payroll. Yeah. And away we went. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I think the other thing that's weird about our culture is your part time salary. Yeah. So you don't have to, you're, you know, you're not punching a time clock for uh-huh. your hours you're working and not working. It's easier for everybody. Well, oh, God. Yeah. It's so much easier <laughs> for me doing payroll. But we also, like you said earlier, like, you know, you're hiring adults yeah. like who know how to do their job. Mm-hmm. And I think that if you don't trust somebody to do their job, either from anywhere at any time, mm-hmm. why did you hire them? Yeah. Why are you hiring people you don't trust? Yeah. Like that makes no sense whatsoever. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe it's just a luxury of being small and being able to be involved as the owner in every yeah. hiring decision. But it just boggles my mind. Even when I was at very large companies, like you got a team leader that's like, you know, having 10, 15 Maybe I think 30 was the biggest my team was. Yeah. I was involved in everybody getting hired and the culture fit was a big deal Mm -hmm. because we tried to have a culture for the team, even inside of what might have been a less desirable culture. Yeah. And that's it's yeah, totally, totally true. Like your immediate supervisor, immediate manager plays such a pivotal role Mm -hmm. in in that like immediate culture piece. We talked with a, in another interview about our kind of non-traditional interview process where it's like, you just like show up for a panel interview and we talk about your favorite food for 20 minutes and then decide if you're a sociopath or not. And then what's your favorite local restaurant? Exactly. Like don't say Taco Bell. Like if you throw a chain out there, you're probably not getting hired. Not happening. We're not interested. I do love a good cheesy gordita crunch, but that's the story for another day. Yeah. Um, Yeah. I, um, one of our kind of quick hits was like any experiences with bad work culture. And I was like, I don't think we have time for that. Uh, and I definitely don't think we do now. I think we're probably running over a little bit is my guess. Um, yeah. I think the, the bottom line for me is just like treat people like people. And hmm? it, it seems like such a rudimentary concept, but for whatever reason, like a lot of people manage to really get that wrong. And it, it just doesn't. I don't know. It just, it seems so easy, but it's, I guess it's not. I mean, it's, I don't think it's that hard. I mean, (laughs) because you're doing a really great job. Thank you. (laughs) But I mean, as an owner, so the the hardest thing for me is, you know, as it comes to be tax time Mm -hmm. um, and I pull out like a balance sheet and a P and L I see every dollar that we spend on employee benefits. Mm -hmm. And I know how much I budget for percent of benefits above and beyond your salary. Yeah. Um, and when I look at the amount that we put into like the 401k, I feel really good about it yeah. because our expense means that you guys are contributing mm-hmm. and that, you know, 
you know, I won't be around forever and not everybody will be together forever, but yeah. you've at least started off on a healthy investing habit. Mm-hmm. Um, the DoorDash one's a really great thing. I mean, that costs us about $15,000 a year, yeah. um, actually a little bit more than that, which seems like a lot of money. And yeah, if we didn't do that as the owner, I can put that money in my pocket, Right. but we're food motivated. And I know that. <laughs> And honestly, you know, when people leave, that is the hardest thing to give up. They're like, I'm going to have to pay for my DoorDash. Yeah. And And like, "Mm, like, what does the attrition cost? You know, like if it's it's, expensive, exactly. It's very expensive. It's like you hire somebody new who's coming in because your culture is shit. And then you start over and you've all, you know, like that's $15,000 sunk right there. We've all talked to like churn and burn agencies. We know some of them who just burn people out in one or two years and Mm -hmm. then rehire. Yeah. And that's exhausting. Yeah. Like teaching those new people everything. Right. Um, I would much rather keep people happy and keep them here. Mm-hmm. I mean, we monitor salaries every year. We started going to twice a year because things were really shifting weird. Yeah. Um, to try to make sure everybody's paid fairly. I um, <laughs> somehow got like added to a, a like, it's like Reddit for agency people. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. And, uh, one of the questions that popped up was like, what's your agency doing for hot? Like, did you get a holiday bonus this year? And all of them were like, uh, we got a $25 like visa gift card and it's like big agencies. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to keep my contribution to myself. Like, I don't need to tell you that I work for an agency of 12 people and we got like a pretty baller bonus yeah, it was in 2021. Decent. Like, yeah, it, it Decent is underselling. I think you're That's underselling. That's fine. I mean, it's... <laughs> I mean, I've been places where like one year I got a hundred percent of my salary as a bonus, but that's oh, huge companies, okay. t- you know, and, but it was, so I guess it was decent. yeah, I was there for the money, yeah. like, and it was obviously it was there for the money, but yeah. definitely did not have a lot of the cultural things we do. Yeah. No, I do know that it's like, it's more than a pittance, like mm-hmm. obviously. And it was something that was very meaningful for, I think every employee. Yeah. Um, I know one employee said, you know, she'd never gotten a bonus anywhere before. Mm-hmm. And then to get one like of that size, she was like, this is great. And I'm like, well, if we all do the work we're going to do the next couple of years, they'll be even bigger because yeah. um, we're also very transparent, which I think creates I, a great culture. We haven't even talked about that, but like that is one of the things we talked in our like all hands kind of yearly strategy. Mm-hmm. The level of transparency here is unheard of. I mean, like I, like I said, I've worked a lot of places and to have the amount of access that we do to our leadership team, but also just the like, you lay it out and here's our balance sheet and here's where we Mm -hmm. are. And here's what I'm thinking about for the next two or three or five years. And like, what does that look like for you? What does that look like for us as a team? It's yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I remember in that particular one, this last year, the slide, as we went into the year about like, Hey, so if we have a profit, which we're projected to have, and we did like, here's the amount I'm going to take Mm because I own the business. I'm taking a profit. Mm -hmm. And everybody's like, yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Here's what we're going to reinvest back into the business. Yeah. And then here's the piece that we're going to fund a bonus pool for. Mm -hmm. And whether that's based on a percent of your salary or it's an even split, I think we did an even split this last year. Um, that's, you know, neither here nor there, but, you know, I'll decide that because at mm-hmm. some point I have to make a decision, but this is the bucket. So, you know, if we have, you know, $300,000 in profit, this percent is the bonus pool. Yeah. You can do the math in your head and think like, okay, well, some so, of us need a calculator. But. Yeah, well, true. <laughs> I would need a calculator. Um, but that was all laid out there. And I think mm-hmm. for an owner of a business to lay out, like, this is what I'm taking from the business um, is unique because I know other people who own businesses who just take everything. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's really short-sighted. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it's, uh, I don't know. It's an interesting journey, but it seems like it's working. Mm-hmm. I feel like we have pretty happy employees. We all kind of mesh really well together. Yeah. I hear good things. I don't always know what's going on, but I try to like, just keep my feelers out. Yeah. Um, I will tell you the transparency though, has co- two people left because of the transparency. They couldn't handle knowing that much about what's going on in the business, which boggled my mind. And then I'm like, well, they weren't, a, they weren't a good fit anyway. You know, they shouldn't be with a small business if you don't want to that's know everything that's going yeah. on. Yeah. yeah. Even positive or negative. Like, you know, and anytime there's negative, it's like, here's where the negative is. Here's what we're doing about it. And uh-huh. here's where we're going. Yeah. You know, we lost a client and, you know, people said, are we not going to hire a new AE? And right. it's like, no, no, no. We're still hiring yeah. a new AE. Like we're out of capacity. Yeah. Like even, even without, with that client yeah. gone, we're out of capacity. Mm-hmm. I need that person so to that we can grow. To be able to keep growing. Yeah. I mean, and then it just lucked out that you wanting to go part time. Yeah. Like it all just really aligned well. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know if that's just good karma because I 
treat everybody well or <laughs> if it's just you got some good stuff i think you've got some good stuff coming your way in the pipeline i think so i'm like, thinking we should have made this two episodes right um, but it's gonna be our we'll call it a mega episode a maybe. mega episode it'll be our first mega episode yeah and clearly when you and i start talking we just will talk for there's, hours and there's hours. no there's no end absolutely yeah all right so i think uh parting shot what is um is, there, is this like our quick tip? Our quick tip this week is just treat people treat, like people. Yeah, treat people like it's people. It's revolutionary, folks. Like, it was crazy. Yeah, and I think as an owner, you know, my quick tip, we'll just throw these in here and let our producer deal with it. Um, <laughs> but my quick tip would be that, you know, if it's something that you would want from a company, give it to your employees. Mm-hmm. Um, if it benefits them, if it keeps them happier, healthier, more secure, more safe, just do it. Yeah. Like the finances will work it, it out. We've given health insurance for most of the length of this company. The company's been around 20 years mm-hmm. and health insurance has been a part of what we've done for a very long time. Yeah. And it's a benefit we have never looked at getting rid of even in bad times. Mm-hmm. Like we've found ways to fund the company. So I think just do the right thing and do what your employees need and what makes them healthy, happy, and safe. And the money will work it out. It'll mm-hmm. all work itself out. Yeah. And if it doesn't, then maybe don't be in business. I don't know. <laughs> go work for somebody else. <laughs> That's probably a good one. And we hope you have a good culture if yeah. you do go work for somebody right. else. All right. I think we'll leave it there. And uh, we'll catch you on the next one. That's it for another episode of Cocktails, Tangents, and Answers. We hope you enjoyed listening. We enjoyed recording and this week's cocktail. You can find me on Twitter or Instagram at Rich Mackey. I try not to make it too difficult. It's just my name. And you can find our agency at Antidote underscore 71. That's A-N-T-I-D-O-T-E underscore 71 on Twitter and Instagram as well. And you can find me at home sipping a craft cocktail prepared by my in-home bartender. It's my husband. We'll be back next week with another episode and a whole new cocktail recipe, plenty more tangents, and of course, answers to those pressing marketing questions. And if you'd like to send us a question, you can go to ctapodcast.live to get in touch. Or you can call our hotline at 402-718-9971 and leave us a voicemail. Your questions might be used for future episodes of the podcast. For now, like and subscribe, and we'll see you next week.